Uh, hey everyone, welcome. Uh, if you have found your way here, that means you're probably curious about post-quantum cryptography, or you're interested in hearing AWS's migration plan for PQ, or you're lost and you're confused, and in any of those cases, you're in the right place. We're gonna get into demystifying post-quantum crypto. Uh, goal with this session is really just to show everyone it's not as scary as you may think. It's pretty straightforward if you have the right information. Uh, so that's what we're here for. By way of introduction, my name is Rashir Patel. I lead the worldwide GTM for AWS data protection, cryptography, and identity services. Uh, you probably are asking why uh, I am uh, you should listen to someone like me about this topic. I'm not a cryptographer. I am not a PhD mathematician. However, I've spent the last four years with AWS, uh, working closely with the AWS cryptography team as they're navigating this new security landscape shift in post-quantum. Prior to that, I spent several years with the good folks over at IBM as they went through the same. So all in all, I've spent about half my career revolving around this world of post-quantum. And now today I get to share with you all the things I've learned over those years. Uh, Avni, principal PM from AWS Cryptography, is here to keep me honest and answer all of your questions afterwards. Uh, so getting into what we're gonna cover, first off we wanna just overview what is the quantum risk, get on the same page with what exactly are we protecting against. Uh, top things to understand, so we've tried to come up with just three high level things that we want you to walk away from this session with. There's a lot of information out there, possibly misinformation, um, and a lot of it's distracting. We just want to rally around these, these few top things. Uh, as with all things security on AWS, it's a shared responsibility model. There's some things we're responsible for and some things customers are responsible for, so we'll cover that at a high level. And then industry perspective, something a lot of customers have asked about recently is how does this apply in my industry and my use cases? Where should we be, be focused? Uh, and then at the end, guidance, resources, things you can leave with that should help you on your PQ journey. Uh, so starting out, what is the quantum risk? What are we dealing with here? What are we protecting ourselves from? So to answer that question, we have to understand a little bit about what is class classical encryption? How does it work? So in, in layman's terms, encryption is really complex math problems that computers can solve really easily and efficiently in one direction, and it's really difficult, if not impossible, to solve in the opposite direction without that critical piece of information, which is your encryption key. Um, so that changes a little bit because quantum computers can now solve those math problems in the reverse direction without the encryption keys. Uh, they're using something known as Shor's algorithm or Grover's algorithm. Uh, that's quite a deep rabbit hole if you want to go down that path. If you are curious, there's a new session we're piloting tomorrow, 500 level session, senior technical leader from AWS is going to deep dive to those, uh, into those quantum algorithms. 10 a.m. tomorrow, Matt Campagna, amazing speaker, super interesting, highly recommend you check it out. Um, so yes, quantum computers have the potential, uh, a large scale fault tolerant quantum computer, which has not been achieved yet, it can break our, our current encryption. And largely the encryption that's impacted is asymmetric public key crypto. That's what we're focused on. Uh, so RSA and elliptic curve cryptography is where the impact is centered. Uh, so while these computers don't exist yet, we are expecting them to be around in the next several years. And so we at AWS take our customers' confidentiality of their data very seriously. We're taking steps to protect it. Uh, this is probably the most technical slide. This is a 200 level talk, so we'll get through this one quickly. Um, but the red boxes are just there to show where our crypto is going to be impacted. Uh, up in the top left under confidentiality, the Diffie-Hellman key agreement process, that is an asymmetric crypto uh, method. Uh, so that initial handshake that establishes a secure connection between two endpoints, uh, that is something that we have to uh, evolve and adapt. The other is the digital signatures that protect the integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation qualities of our data. Uh, that is something that needs to be evolved as well. If you'll notice, things like hashing functions, HMAX, and AES encryption are not circled, and that's because they're based on symmetric key crypto. They are fine. They are marginally, minimally impacted by quantum computers. The crypto we use there today is considered safe. So if you're encrypting your data on AWS with KMS, AES-256 keys, you're largely protected, you're good to go. Um, 
So you may have heard some things around this harvest now, decrypt later type attack where uh, a nation state entity may harvest your data on the public internet and save it for 10 years where they can decrypt it and get a bunch of sensitive information. That's largely what people hear when they think about uh, why do we need to start doing this stuff today? We have other security priorities. Why is post-quantum important for us if uh, these computers don't exist yet? And I think the real answer to that is crypto just takes a really long time to roll out. Uh, if we look historically, um, about going back to I think the early 2000s when we deprecated desks and switched over to AES, it took a really long time for that to roll out to everywhere it was needed. Um, and so that's what we're planning for. NIST started this competition process around 2016, and it's been going on for the past 10 years. Uh, they had a call for submissions for new algorithms, and they've spent the past decade having academic researchers test them and evaluate them. They're looking for security vulnerabilities. They're looking for performance issues so they can catch it in the design phase and not later once everything's been deployed. So that takes about 10 years, millions of cryptographer hours. Uh, once we get to that stage, uh, organizations around the world, standards bodies, will standardize those algorithms. So NIST, Etsy, IETF, uh, PCI, the CAB forum is going to go and create standards around these technologies, which then give us the green light to go and adopt them. So 20 years in, you'll start to see widespread adoption of new uh, algorithms and technologies. Uh, and it is a challenge. You think of the payment industry where algorithms like triple DES, which are considered insecure, are still used on a lot of payment terminals. And that's because it's a challenge to update every single terminal that exists in the world. So that's what we're dealing with here. That's why we're starting early. There is some good news. Uh, culmination of a lot of these research efforts happened early, late last year, August 2024. NIST published its first of these standards. Uh, under the, the FIPS 203, 204, 205. So you'll see ML Chem is the new uh, cryptographic algorithm for key encapsulation, replacing that Diffie Helmet key agreement. And then ML DSA and SLH DSA are two digital signature algorithms to replace RSA and elliptic curve technology rely on. Um, initially, it's going to be used in a hybrid scheme. I think one day in the future, we may be solely using post quantum algorithms. But now that they're standardized, we have the green light. AWS is starting to adopt these. Uh, we've been implementing the, the draft versions for several years now to test uh, performance at scale. There's a lot of implications that accompany the size of AWS. Um, but now we're ready for the final production versions. So we're done with the background now. That's all framing these top things to understand. Uh, you're going to see this slide three times, each time with a little bit more information. Um, but let's start with this first bit. Uh, so first thing we wanted to get across is that post-quantum on AWS, like all things security, is going to be a shared responsibility. There are things that AWS is going to do on behalf of customers. We've set aside a two to five year roadmap of us rolling out these changes. Our goal is to roll them out transparently uh, so they are minimally impacting you as they come out. Uh, then there's also customer responsibilities here. Um, there are things that we are unable to do for you as much as we want to, and so customers are responsible to make some changes as well. Uh, and as a general rule of thumb, managed services shift more of that responsibility to AWS. So if you're using a service like KMS, ACM, Secrets Manager, you will have to do very little, if anything, to leverage post-quantum capabilities of those services. Secrets Manager, I think, today already has post-quantum enabled. Uh, for the other services, one day we will flip a switch, they will be post-quantum compatible, you won't have to do anything. Um, sans the customer responsibility, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, so let's understand a bit about what that shared responsibility looks like. AWS security of the cloud. Uh, we are going to be going through all of our public services, service endpoints, and updating them to leverage post-quantum TLS. So Bedrock, Shield, uh, everything public internet facing will be updated over the next two to five years. Uh, note that this is only our service endpoints. There is a client-server relationship here where a client has to be updated to, in order to negotiate post-quantum TLS. Um, so that's part of the, the customer side of the responsibility model. Uh, if you have a, a client application that is not post-quantum compatible, it won't fail the connection in the future. It'll just fall back to the, late, the previous version of TLS, uh, which we use today. Uh, all of our 
networking resources like API Gateway and CloudFront that front your critical resources, those are going to be updated as well. There's some that kind of falls in between the shared responsibility. Uh, you'll see this by the orange little cog wheel. So for example, ELB, we are going to be updating this service with post quantum ciphers. However, a customer has to go in and select those ciphers in the configuration. It's a little bit from each party. Uh, same thing goes for the AWS SDKs. We're gonna be updating and, and providing these SDKs. Customers have to update to the latest version and leverage any new code patterns. Uh, and then shared responsibility within the cloud, you'll see the little pink icons denoting where AWS cannot do everything for you. Uh, so something like an on-premise corporate firewall, that is the customer's responsibility. You likely have to engage your firewall vendor to learn about their migration plan. Uh, things like source code for your custom applications on-premise or bespoke applications you may be running on AWS, you'll have to go in and inspect your code, understand your cryptographic dependencies, and update them. That's the customer responsibility. Top things to understand part two. Uh, so the urgency to upgrade is going to vary by industry and by use case. Not all use cases are created equal. Not all of them need to be solved immediately. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, we're starting with confidentiality of data in transit. That's probably our priority use cases. Uh, digital signatures next. There is some implications around long lived roots of trust that we have to figure out. Uh, and then authentication last, not because it's not important, it's just simply the least urgent. Our authentication systems aren't really compromised until Q day happens, um, and so we're able to put that third on the priority list. So getting into some of the details of those industry perspectives, this is something a lot of customers and partners have asked us recently. Um, so this first general security use case, confidentiality of sensitive data, uh, and intellectual property is a priority. So any of your data in transit, you want to protect from that future-facing harvest now, decrypt later scenario. So if you're operating in financial services or healthcare and life sciences, you think about personal financial data, healthcare records, biometrics, genomic data. Uh, I heard there's a startup recently that's scanning people's eyeballs. That is certainly uh, proprietary, long-lived information that we would want to protect immediately. Um, and then anyone working with AI tools, which I'm guessing is most of you, your, your models that you're developing, proprietary models, uh, confidential training data that you use internally, all of that is your intellectual property that you should think about protecting and pr prioritize. The other security use case is around protecting the integrity and authenticity of your infrastructure and devices. This one takes a little bit of explanation. So if you're familiar with the manufacturing process for devices like IoT or smart home devices, they'll typically install a digital certificate in the device at manufacturing time. This is a one-time process. You can't go back later and update those certificates. So if you think about a device like a connected vehicle that's gonna exist in the world for the next decade, a long-lived device, you have to think about uh, protecting the integrity and authenticity of that device 10 years into the future. So you wanna migrate away from existing PKI to post-quantum PKI as soon as possible. This applies to critical infrastructure. A lot of uh, you know, oil and gas production supply chain has IoT devices that uh, do monitoring and telemetry that need to be protected. Connected cars, satellites, uh, wearables, medical devices, all of that falls under this category. Uh, and top things to understand, part three, Enterprise-wide updates like this take a lot of time and require agility. Uh, we want customers to focus on inventorying their cryptographic use cases, becoming crypto agile, and building out your automation and processes, because these are things that are gonna pay dividends over the lifetime of future crypto migrations. Uh, my personal opinion is that post-quantum is maybe 20% about the technology itself, algorithms and software updates, it's 80% organizational change management. You need to identify and set your policy and your governance structure, have a single threaded leader who will work across stakeholders and application owners to own this change across everywhere where it's relevant. If you don't go at it with a good uh, organizational approach, it's gonna be fragmented and decentralized and you're not actually solving the problem here. General guidance, practical next steps, what can you do uh, today, when you go back to your, your organizations or at the end of the week. 
First thing is don't attempt an all-at-once migration. This is not going to be solved in a month. Plan for a multi-year migration, transition, uh, and prioritize based on risk. Start with those priority sensitive data use cases and deprioritize the things that are less sensitive. Get the, to those in years three, four, or five. A lot of customers we speak to um, are planning around 2030 uh, to end their post quantum migrations. That's the timelines we're talking about here. If you want a practical security campaign, your CISO, you want to run something this year that's going to be impactful, you can upgrade to TLS 1.3 across your organization. This is something not a lot of customers have done fully. Um, and it's something that's important. TLS 1.3 is a prerequisite for post-quantum. It'll only be available on this latest version of the protocol. So you have to update at some point. Better to get started sooner. Inventorying your crypto is one of the big challenges we see customers face. Uh, you want to understand all of your crypto usage and dependencies across your organization within source code, uh, software libraries, packages, and service endpoints. Um, that is a big process. If you have thoughts or questions about how to approach that, reach out to your account SA to get started. Um, and then one thing, uh, one of my colleagues has talked about this as uh, these last three things is get good at the things you need to be good at. If you don't have a DevOps program, you need one. Automated software deployment, CICD pipelines, version control, rollbacks, all of that is necessary. It's good for your security program in general. It's pretty critical to becoming post-quantum enabled in the future. Um, focus on building reusable processes. So something I've learned working with the engineering teams at AWS over the years, when they have a problem to solve, they think about the solution in, how can we build this solution once and never have to build it again and maintain it as little as possible? So that's kind of how you want to approach these things and think about them. Uh, AWS libraries are a great example. We have a team internally that vends something called AWS Lib Crypto. It is a FIPS 140-3 uh, validated software module. We maintain that. All of Amazon uses it. It's open source. We don't charge for it. Um, it is, think of it as a primitive that you can leverage. It will always be updated. It is very performant. Um, and that is something that you don't have to take on the burden of building. You can leverage AWS's open source leadership in this space. Getting to the end here, uh, some resources you can check out. The first is our post-quantum migration blog. If you want a framework for how to approach this, you can look to our plan. That is available publicly online. We have a hands-on workshop. Uh, I find that one of the best ways to contextualize new technology is get hands-on with it. It becomes a lot less intimidating once you do that. We have this, uh, this workshop free for use. And then our post-quantum hub, a lot of different white papers, research papers, blogs about the topic that you can check out. One last thing I'm going to call out tomorrow, that workshop I just mentioned is being delivered uh, by good, good colleagues of mine, Patrick and Margot. Uh, it is at noon tomorrow. It is a great workshop, maybe the best one I've taken at AWS. It is really good to help you understand what you're dealing with when it comes to implementing PQ. Uh, and that is tomorrow. And the last thing I will say is I would appreciate the session survey. AWS is a data-driven company. We like the feedback so we can improve our programming for reInvent, Summit, everything in the future. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be right over here. Thanks, Alton.